heading into this project, I did it in quite a cavalier way, thinking that everything would be okay. I suppose when the reality dawns that you're going to get all this information and there might be things in there that I hadn't really been expecting to find. It was an opportunity to find out a lot more, um, just from curiosity point of view, a lot more about my genome. And incidentally, of course, you find out about your family's genome at the same time. The first complete human genome sequences were published just over 20 years ago. We have learned a lot since then, but there is still much more to learn. Your genome is the complete set of genetic instructions found in almost every cell of your body. Genome sequencing is a way of analysing your unique genetic information by reading the DNA chemical code in which it is written. We can then compare it to other sequenced genomes in a population and look for mutations or variants that may put us at higher risk of certain diseases. I live with my family, um, my four children and my husband uh, in Surrey. Unfortunately I'm a widow, I've got three uh, teenage children, um, Phoebe, Lydia and Oliver, and they're aged uh, 19, 17 and 16. The more whole genome sequences that we study from both sick and healthy individuals, the more we can discover about what each variant or mutation does, and what health problems these genetic differences could cause throughout our lives. I live in Wimbledon with my husband Roy. We don't have children uh, yet, but um, I do have a brother. Uh, we're alone here, we don't, our families are abroad. I've got a sister and a brother. Uh, I'm the eldest of four boys, uh, but there's a pretty big gap between uh, the other three. Uh, 10 years, 11 years and 16 years, so I'm probably more like an uncle than an older brother. There are different types of genetic variants, which affect either single letters, a few words, or even whole paragraphs of our genetic instructions. Current genome tests look predominantly at the most common type of genetic variation, called SNPs or SNPs. These differences involve just a single letter change to our DNA code. Studies of common SNPs show that 99.9% .9 of our genomes are the same, which means that around one in every thousand DNA letters differs between any two unrelated people. Most of these variations have no effect, but some affect the way we look, and others may affect our risk of disease. We inherit half of our genome from each parent and pass half of our own genomes onto each of our children. I live in Canterbury, my wife and two children. Uh, one is 16, the other one is 13, and they're both boys. I come from a big family. I am the youngest of six. I have four older brothers and an identical twin sister. I also have a baby on the way. <laughs> Ten healthy participants were offered whole genome sequencing. The group included professionals from academic and laboratory science, the biotech industry, bioethics and law. Here are some of their experiences. So we were in France then. My mum was a French teacher. She's in the background there. This photo I love because her, her smile in this photo, when I was looking through these, I really realised um, is very similar to my elder daughter, Lucy. I think they've got a very similar smile and, and she's more similar. I think she looks more similar to my mum, look, looking back on younger pictures of my mum as well than she does to me, really. My mother was diagnosed with quite an aggressive form of breast cancer at the age of 57. Uh, we initially, she had treatment and we initially thought that it had been cured um, but it returned, she had secondary bone cancer uh, and she passed away in early 2006, aged just 60. I was found these pictures which are, is my four children now, ice creams in the park. I didn't realise this at the time but this was the last time that um, mum was kind of well enough to go out with us for the day. So this was towards the end of 2004. She really had no of the, of the risk factors that you would think of for, for breast cancer. She had no lifestyle risk factors, which made me start to wonder uh, if there was kind of some genetic risk that she had, and if so, whether I might have inherited a, a, a genetic mutation. There's still quite a lot of limitations, you know. Uh, discovering the entire human genome 20 odd years ago was really the first step. We're 20 years on, we know a lot more than we did 20 years ago. I always say, if you want to watch TV, you have to buy a TV. And there's bigger and better TVs come out all the time, but at some point you have to commit and buy a TV. So me getting my genome sequence today was me buying a, the, the first TV and, and getting to watch something and find out something. 
we also thought that, you know, looking forward to having a family one day, another thing to, to, um, to, to know is that whether we have any diseases that could cause problems in the future. So if we had, uh, if we were carrying um, an alteration in a gene that, actually in the same gene, right, then um, we, um, we would have a higher risk to have an infected child one day. When I was asked about it, I rang my twin sister and I said, do you mind if I get our genome sequenced? And even saying that gave me an insight into the fact that I was very aware that it wasn't just information for me, but it was information for her. Sorry, it, the yeah. Wow. <laughs> I know. But what's weird is, like, again, I didn't really think about our risks as being the same, which is true. So even though she and I have an identical genome, it's no different to us both being given a book when we were born. We both carry that book around with us. I may fall in the pond, she may, you know, let it out in the rain. It's your life experiences that affect your genome. The same words are written in the book, but your day-to-day -day experiences, your diet, your exposures, your illnesses will affect the words on the page. Process like, you know, just before it and, and doing it, what did you do? <laughs> I spat in a tube. <laughs> I think all in all it was really straightforward process. The test is so easy. It, you don't even need to take a blood sample today. Sequencing a genome from a person involves taking a sample of their DNA. This can be obtained by collecting cells from the mouth found in saliva. Each participant supplies a sample, signs a consent form countersigned by a medical professional, and the sample is sent to a laboratory for processing. Their unique genomic information is then cross-referenced against a database and the results returned in the form of a comprehensive report which includes a range of genetic information, including any clinically significant findings, disease predispositions and pharmacogenetic sensitivities which could have an impact on their current or future health. I was not worried, uh, but I was curious of, of the results. I was excited and I was surprised to find myself also a bit nervous, which I hadn't anticipated. Genetic counselling was provided before and after the participants received their results. This is critically important as it ensures that participants understand the test scope and limitations as well as providing explanation and support in the event of any confusing, unexpected or upsetting findings. I found myself probably a bit impatient with knowing they had my information and knowing that they had to go through the formality of speaking about what I was about to hear. The biggest kind of standout result for me, um, which made it completely worthwhile doing the test, even if that had been the only result I got, was that I don't have any of the mutations currently known to be associated with breast cancer. Um, and I think that once I knew that, I did have this incredible feeling of relief that made me realise I didn't I hadn't appreciated how much it had been at the back of my mind that I'd been worrying about it. Um, not only for myself, but I have two daughters. My daughters, who are pretty smart and pretty switched on, both said, after they lost their mum a couple of years on, but said, we're really worried about getting breast cancer. Um, and they didn't need to say because of mum, because that's where they think the risk is coming from. I knew the basic format of the test report, and I knew that if you have a red box and it's got something in it, it means there's a finding. And I saw it was a uh, breast cancer mutation risk. So basically it's a BRCA1 mutation, it, it's dominant, which means you only need one copy of it to have an effect. Um, I almost certainly inherited it from my dad, but they've said to me at different times, or at least one of them has said, Dad, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get breast cancer. I'm pretty sure I might have to have my breast removed. So getting this actual result rather than this kind of speculative result that they thought from their mum was, was kind of devastating initially. Um, you know, first of all, I felt guilty. I felt, you know, I felt angry with my dad. And, you know, the reality is you don't have any control over this. This is just passed down through generations. Um, and why should I feel angry at him? Um, I suppose I'm worried they're going to be angry with me. I, I, you know, and I haven't told them yet. And the reason I haven't told them is because they've got their exams. And. I don't think they need this extra burden right now. It must feel like it's sort of quite a significant gift, isn't it, to the medical community by doing it. It's not that I don't care about the bigger community, but I mean, you tend to look 
<laughs> to your family first and then the community. I'm conscious that I'm, you know, giving this information to camera before I've spoken to them. As a child, I always enjoyed um, The Incredible Hulk and the other superhero um, series. And I think there's always been a part of me that hoped maybe there was something different and special about me. And of course there isn't, I'm, um, uh, uh, I'm pretty dull uh, in terms of my, my genome. Um, I, there were no um, serious concerns that came to light as a result, which is a, obviously a blessing and a, a, and a relief. Well, overall, my results were um, surprisingly uninteresting, <laughs> I guess is, is the way to put it. Um, you know, there were no uh, disease-causing variants uh, that, that were identified, um, at least none that were associated with the, the sort of classic database of, of uh, known disease-causing variants. There was, or there is, one risk factor that was discovered which is that I have a higher risk of melanoma, which is a type of like, an, an aggressive type of skin cancer. But now knowing that I have a higher risk of, of getting that type of skin cancer in the future will definitely make me think twice and you know, be more careful with putting sunscreen and um, doing regular checks and things like that. Also, luckily, we both, me and my husband, we don't have mm -hmm. any, we don't have alterations in the same genes, which means there's no risk at least of the genes that were tested, there's no risk that um, we will have an affected baby in the future of, of like a major disease. Commercial DNA testing is commonly associated with so-called ancestry reports. The genome sequencing in this project also gave participants an insight into their heritage. So I think the most interesting part of this journey for me was I discovered I had an Eastern Mediterranean origin of something like nearly uh, 11%. Now, genetics is all about probabilities and calculations, but around 11% suggests that that's a great-grandparent. Now, it could be made up of a series of 1% that all just come together by chance. However, the most likely outcome is that I have a great-grandparent of, um, say, Greek or Turkish origin. Now, I've asked my parents about their grand grandparents, and do they know? And the answer is no. Their grandparents, as far as they were aware, were in one case Irish and in the other case German. So it's a, it's a curious one, um, but that was my biggest surprise, I think. Obtaining such a comprehensive report on our health raises the issue of medical privacy. When calculating a pension, health insurance or life insurance, how much should organisations be allowed to know about us? Well, genetic privacy is a is a hot topic. So there's no law at the moment which prevents insurance companies from asking for genetic information. Depends how they use it, right? Is it going to bias or discriminate that individual um, because uh, of a pre-existing condition or because uh, they have an elevated risk of certain diseases? Um, I think if that's the case, uh, then it's really up to uh, governments to regulate that. I wouldn't want to disclose uh, this information to an insurer, insurance company, mm. uh, but I don't know, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, I haven't thought How about How insurance is here. I think with these genetic factors, mostly these are not existing diseases, right? So just the fact that you have a higher, that I have a higher susceptibility to melanoma, for example, doesn't mean I will definitely get that disease in the future. You're, you can't change your genome at least not yet, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, people shouldn't, uh, shouldn't suffer uh, because of something they have no control over. Um, but as to whether it's fair, it, it's very difficult because, of course, the majority of customers or purchasers of insurance may well benefit uh, by having lower premiums if everyone is required to provide the outcome of uh, genetic analysis. It's only the, the few that would be adversely affected by having to reveal their diagnosis. In addition to revealing the increased chance of developing particular diseases, genome testing can also reveal an individual's intolerances or sensitivities to particular foods. It can also provide important information about how they may react to certain medications, so-called pharmacogenomics. I'm at, at an increased risk of having lactose intolerance which is very true. I have a lot of discomfort when I'm drinking a lot of milk. 
Now, I, after receiving this result, I will definitely try to change uh, sources of milk. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, slightly high risk of that. Um, and my first thought was, oh, thank goodness it's not the alcoholic version, so at least I don't have to cut down on drinking quite so much. But one of the things I will do is ask my GP to add it to my medical records so if I'm given a particular drug, they at least know about that. So one of the things that, that popped up was warfarin. Now, I'm not on warfarin at the moment, maybe later in life I, I will be, but to know that I, have, um, uh, I, I need to have a lower dose of that generally, I think is important. Um, I think the most in interesting result for me was about the pharmacogenomics. So it had mentioned that I was um, a low, metabolar, no, low metabolizer of codeine, and I have been prescribed codeine many times. I was in a bad car accident and I broke my back in two places. So when I was given pain medication, I was given codeine, and when I would say it hasn't really made any improvement, I was given a double the dose and you just take it and you trust what you're being given. The idea that I think it's one in 10 people don't react to codeine. We are prescribed things over and over throughout our lives. We are prescribed things on emergency basis. So that in itself would save the health system a lot of money in pointless prescribing. So knowing that uh, there is a test that can really help you um, shape your behavior and do what's good for you, I think it's a very powerful um, tool for the future. Where the future is going to lie is in understanding that information better, keeping up to date with all the latest findings, the latest research findings that go into the clinical databases, which inform the results you'll actually get on your report. And, and one of the things about the one we've had done is that as new information comes about, you can be contacted and told, OK, well, this variant we didn't think meant anything might mean something now. I, I would really like to be able to donate this information and my health records somewhere just because the only way we're going to make sense of what all these genetic variants mean for someone's health long term is by we, there's just a need for a lot of healthy genomes, for a lot of healthy people to kind of donate their genetic information so we can see the genetic changes that don't have any implications for your health. So this, that's kind of the flip side of it, sort of, you know, in the same way that I would donate blood, it'd be nice to just donate that information to kind of add to the body of knowledge. Even though this has given me information about me and my potential offspring, I would still 100% want my children to have their genome sequenced almost immediately. I think it's the type of thing that if there's anything medically actionable, that could be done when a baby is born, why wait? It should be, it should be done there and then. Francis Collins, who was involved in the um, genome project you know, a couple of decades ago, he said, um, genetics is the bullet and environment is what pulls the trigger. You know, it's a good idea to stay healthy. If you're the only parent, it's a good idea to stay healthy. Certainly, as a result of what I found out, I'm going to be making quite a lot of significant changes. And, and that's going to have, you know, hopefully benefits for me and hopefully benefits for the family too. Two weeks ago I, I sort of rejoined the gym thinking okay it's kind of worth doing all this now, it's worth kind of really investing in my health and because I, I've kind of, I feel like I kind of won the genetic lottery a bit so you know it's down now to me to just kind of really make the most of that and do all I can to um, reduce the risk of any long-term health conditions. Hopefully, hopefully in the hope of living you know a long and, and healthy life.